Good morning. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past and present. Geoscience Australia recognises the traditional custodians of the land we have accessed across Northern Australia and recognise the help of many organisations who have facilitated our surveys and who have helped ensure protection of cultural heritage. Geoscience Australia acknowledges all landholders, including pastoralists, industry, government agencies and communities who have facilitated land access for this new geoscience information to be acquired. We also wish to acknowledge our external collaborators who have contributed to the outstanding success of the EFTF program. We acknowledge the support of the Geological Survey of Queensland, the Northern Territory Geological Survey, the Geological Survey of Western Australia, Oscope, the Australian National University and the University of Adelaide. We also acknowledge the collaboration of our colleagues in the Mineral Systems Branch and the groundwater teams here at Geoscience Australia. Today, the Onshore Energy Systems Directorate will present highlights of our EFTF program in the South Nicholson Basin in Northern Territory and in Queensland, and in the Canning Basin in Western Australia. I will present the key findings of the seismic and geochronology programs in the South Nicholson region, Amber Jarrett will present on the energy and hydrocarbon systems of the South Nicholson Basin. Ladina Carr will present our EFTF work in the Canning Basin and the Wakali Kali stratigraphic drilling in Western Australia. And Susanna McFarlane will present on petroleum systems modelling and the source rock component of the EFTF portal. These presentations are distilled from the efforts of all onshore energy te systems team members but in particular, we wish to acknowledge Paul Henson, whose vision, efforts and tenacity underpins the success of our EFTF program over the last four years. In my talk today, I'll present some of the most significant findings of the South Nicholson survey and of the complementary geochronology program completed by the Onshore Energy Systems Directorate under the EFTF program. Before I start, I would like to thank the Seismic and Magnetotelluric Acquisition and Processing Directorate for their contribution, which was central to the success of our seismic program. I would also like to thank the, the Geochronology and Stratigraphy Directorate and the Mineral Separations Labs for their careful and thorough work in collecting quality isotopic data essential for our stratigraphic uh, interpretations. Firstly, let's revisit the location of the South Nicholson EFTF program. In this image, we see the extent of Northern Australia addressed under the EFTF program. The white box highlights the broad area of interest. Just zooming in now, the South Nicholson Basin, highlighted in blue, straddles northeastern Northern Territory and northwestern Queensland, a vast, poorly exposed area roughly the size of the state of Tasmania. The seismic lines which I'll discuss in a moment are shown in black. Geologically, the South Nicholson Basin is juxtaposed between the highly prospective Mount Isa province to the southeast, shown here in brown, and the equally prospective MacArthur Basin to the northwest, in orange. These ge geological entities are separated by the Murphy province, an east-west trending emerging, emergent ridge of metamorphic and igneous basement rocks highlighted in green between the South Nicholson Basin and the MacArthur Basin. All these geological provinces are comprised of stacked Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic sedimentary basins. However, in contrast to the well-studied and highly prospective Mount Isa province and MacArthur Basin, the South Nicholson region, prior to the EFTF program, was comparatively poorly understood by modern standards, with limited understanding of the resource potential. This program has sought to redress this imbalance to improve the regional hydrocarbon and mineral prospectivity of the region and to encourage future greenfield exploration activities. I draw your attention to the soon to be released EFTF extended abstracts volume for further details. The South Nicholson Seismic Survey was completed in 2017, comprising five intersecting lines, totaling around 1,100 line kilometres. Five lines are shown here in yellow and were located specifically to target gravity lows, shown in this image in cool colours, blues and purples, to test for the presence of concealed sedimentary basins. 
The survey also targeted known crustal structures to better understand the regional subsurface geometry of fault systems. And if you are in any doubt why the region is not well understood, this spectacular image taken during the seismic acquisition should explain everything. A major finding from the South Nicholson Seismic Survey is the discovery of a large concealed sedimentary basin, which we have called the Carrara Subbasin. The Carrara Subbasin coincides with one of the major gravity lows targeted during planning. The basin, imaged by a number of the seismic lines, is best illustrated along SN2, shown here along the bottom of the slide and whose location is shown in the inset figure in red. The Carrara Subbasin is a large sag basin, up to 8 kilometres deep, 120 kilometres wide and 190 kilometres from north to south, and interpreted to include rocks of the Isa Superbasin, highly prospective rocks that host the world-class Man Isa copper lead zinc deposit and a number of other regional base metal deposits. It is worth noting that the eastern end of SN1, shown here in the upper right and highlighted in the inset in purple, joins up with a legacy seismic line that intersects the world-class lead zinc century deposit, the host rocks of which can be readily traced into the Carrara subbasin. The Isa superbasin is highlighted in purple in the seismic section shown here. Underlying the Isa superbasin is the Kelvert superbasin in blue and the Likert superbasin overlying basement in brown. All of these successions are overlain by the Mesoproterozoic South Nicholson group in yellow, equivalent to the Roper group in the MacArthur Basin, and in turn covered by a thin veneer of Georgina Basin. Proposed future stratigraphic drilling of the Carrara Subbasin by the MINAC CRC will hopefully confirm these interpretations. Now let's look at some of the structures controlling the evolution of the South Nicholson region. We'll examine the middle section of the north-south aligned SN5 line, highlighted in red in the right-hand figure, located northwest of the Carrara Subbasin and north of a major east-west trending fault system called the Little Ranger's Fault. You will recall that the Carrara Subbasin was a sag basin with little structural disruption. However, north of the Little Range Fault, we have a number of parallel east-west trending fault systems imaged here imaged here in the seismic section. Some of these faults are known from surface mapping and some were not, but all are spectacularly imaged at depth by the seismic data. We believe that these structures formed during two episodes of crustal extension at around 1725 million years ago and again at around 1640 million years ago, forming these north dipping half grabens which you can see in the seismic into which sediments of the Kelvert Superbasin and the Isa Superbasin were deposited. Subsequent crustal contraction resulted in reactivation of these features and resulted in north over south thrusting. Timing of inversion is less well constrained, but probably started with the Isa orogeny around 1600 to 1500 million years ago and continued during early deposition of the South Nicholson sediments, shown here in yellow. These faults also crosscut Cambrian age Georgina Basin sediments, so reactivation was active as recently as the Alice Springs orogeny at around 400 to 300 million years ago. We now look at a simplified geological map highlighting the key structural elements of the region. This map uses a revised group level stratigraphy, which I'll talk about more in the following slides. Along the central part of the north-south seismic line, SN5, we see the east-west fault systems imaged in the previous slide. The key point to note here is that the east-west fault systems imaged in the South Nicholson Seismic Survey are clearly equivalents of concealed east-west fault systems identified in legacy company seismic surveys in the Mount Isa province in Queensland, shown here on the right-hand side of this figure. Those structures, described in the 1990s by the BMR NABAIR program, share remarkably similar geometries with the reactivated thrust faults described here along SN5. We can now confirm a remarkably similar structural evolution with extension and inversion events occurring across the region. 
Better understanding of the structural evolution of the region will improve our knowledge of the tectonic evolution of northern Australia, but also improve our improve models of basin fluid migration pathways, predict sites of base metal deposition, and similarly understand hydrocarbon migration pathways, potential trap and escape pathways. We also conducted a comprehensive geochronology program across the South Nicholson region to complement the seismic program. We analysed 47 samples from outcrop and drill core, improving the geochronology coverage across the region and enabling more confident regional stratigraphic correlations and therefore identification of local rock packages favourable for resource potential. The results have also led to a revision of the existing stratigraphy across the region and one of the major findings is the relocation of some units thought to be Mesoproterozoic South Nicholson group to older late Paleoproterozoic groups. These rock packages have geochronology signatures consistent with deposition during 1640 million years at crustal extension and being deposited into the graben troughs as described earlier. Importantly, these rock packages are now identified as lateral equivalents of the highly prospective isosuper basin sediments and, as we'll see in the next slide, greatly increases the extent of such rocks across the region. Our revised stratigraphy, in summary, expands the known extent of late Paleoproterozoic rocks across the South Nicholson region. In these two figures, we illustrate the changes in group level stratigraphy across the South Nicholson region based on our preliminary revisions. For example, west of the Benmara Fault, highlighted here, previous interpretations included, concluded that those successions were Mesoproterozoic in age. Our stratigraphic revisions suggest that these successions highlighted here are instead late Paleoproterozoic in age and broad stratigraphic equivalents to highly prospective units in the Mount Isa province, which host the lead zinc century deposit, the Mount Isa copper lead zinc deposit, and to the northwest, the MacArthur lead zinc deposit. We also note that these units extend an unknown distance westward beneath the Georgina Basin and northwards under the Carpentaria Basin. It is becoming increasingly late Paleoproterozoic rocks are far more extensive across the region than previously thought and are probably more or less continuous with Mount, between the Mount Isa province and the MacArthur Basin, therefore greatly increasing the resource prospectivity of the region and potential for greenfield exploration. Before I wrap up, I would like to highlight the Barclay Deep Crustal Reflection Seismic Survey. This survey, completed in late 2019, comprised of five lines totalling some 813 line kilometres and was collected to complement the South Nicholson survey. The Barclay survey lines are shown here in these figures, highlighted in blue. In the left-hand figure, we see the Barclay seismic line shown in reference to the regional geological entities as previously discussed. In the right-hand gravity image, we see the Barclay seismic in reference to the gravity lows marking the Beetaloo subbasin and the Carrara Subbasin. You will see that this survey, importantly, links the prospective Beetaloo Subbasin and the newly discovered Carrara Subbasin, and also transects a number of gravity lows, possibly representing additional concealed unknown sedimentary basins. Data from this survey is still being interpreted, and I urge you to visit the EFTF webpage for future updates. The data, however, is currently available at the link provided. I'll finish up by revisiting the major findings that our South Nicholson EFTF program has revealed. Firstly, the discovery of the Carrara Subbasin, a large, highly prospective Proterozoic basin beneath the Barclay Tablelands. We have resolved a detailed understanding on the structural evolution of the region with correlation to major structures identified in the Lawn Hill platform of the Mount Isa province. We have identified two major episodes of crustal extension at 1725 million years ago and 1640 million years ago, with multiple episodes of crustal contraction from the Proterozoic Eisen orogeny to the Paleozoic Alice Springs orogeny. We have revised the stratigraphy and improved regional correlations, which have resulted in increased geographic extent of highly prospective late Paleoproterozoic stratigraphy 
and which extends an unknown distance westward beneath the Georgina and Carpentaria basins, thus increasing the resource potential such as for uh, MVT and SEDEX style base metal occurrences across the South Nicholson region. There are many other details our program has revealed and I urge you to examine our EFTF extended abstracts and other, other publications and the, uh, visit the uh, South Nicholson webpage for further information. Thank you. Hello. Today I'm going to present some of the highlights of our South Nicholson Region Data Acquisition Program and Shale Gas Prospectivity Analysis. This is a multidisciplinary project using data and interpretations from staff members across the agency, in addition to collaborations with state and territory surveys and universities. Paleoproterozoic to Mesoproterozoic sedimentary basins in Northern Australia have considerable energy potential. Currently, petroleum exploration is largely focused in the Beetaloo sub-basin of the MacArthur Basin and the Eagle Arboria Prospect in the Northern Lawn Hill platform, as seen in this figure as red circles. Many other shale units in this region may have petroleum potential, however there is limited data availability and the prospectivity is largely unknown, hence the motivation to study the poorly understood South Nicholson region. Here you can see a stratigraphic chart of the South Nicholson region. Although there are not commercially producing systems, multiple hydrocarbon shows of oil and gas demonstrate that a petroleum system is likely present. Several shale units are proposed as potential source rocks, including shales from the Mesoproterozoic South Nicholson group and shales and carbonates from the Paleoproterozoic Fickling and McNamara groups. These Paleoproterozoic units have been divided into seven super sequences that we can interpret on the seismic. A recent interpretation of the South Nicholson Seismic Survey reveals that thick packages of these super sequences are present in the newly discovered Carrara subbasin, in addition to sediments from the overlying South Nicholson group. The question now is, what is the shale gas potential in this depot centre? In the MacArthur Basin to the north, there is an extensive geochemical data set that demonstrates that several shale units have excellent source rock potential. The geochemistry also reveals that these shales are oil and gas prone. Additionally, multiple gas and oil shows in the region demonstrate the presence of a petroleum system, and therefore this region is being actively explored by the petroleum industry. If we compare these geochemical results from the MacArthur Basin to the similarly aged shales in South Nicholson region, we can see from first glance that this data is extremely limited in comparison. And in some places, the data quality here is quite poor. There is some indication that there are organically rich intervals, particularly in the lawn and river super sequences in Northwest Queensland, and that is where petroleum exploration has largely focused. However, our knowledge of kerogen type and hydrocarbon generative potential in a regional perspective is quite limited. To further understand the energy potential of the region, Geoscience Australia completed a geochemical data acquisition program. We sampled all legacy boreholes that intersected mesoproterozoic and paleoproterozoic units. This was undertaken in collaboration with the mineral section here at Geoscience Australia. Together we analysed over 2,500 samples from across the region. A streamlined methodology was undertaken for all samples. Geoscience Australia's in-house laboratories analysed each sample for Rocky Valve Pyrolysis, XRD, XRF and ICPMS with all data published as releases on our EFTF portal as they become available. A select number of immature and organically rich shales were further analysed for detailed organic geochemistry. A combination of GCMS and GCIRMS was used to understand the composition of hydrocarbons in the region. 
The results from our study demonstrates several shales and carbonates have good to excellent organic richness. Rocky Vale pyrolysis demonstrates trends of a low hydrogen index coupled with high produ production indices. This, in addition to mature to overmature shales, indicates that there are little generative potential remaining in some of these rocks, although exploration results show that these produced hydrocarbons are likely to be retained in the shale, which is favourable in a shale gas or oil gas system. Bulk kerogen kinetics were undertaken on immature source rocks to understand their hydrocarbon generative envelope. The results show a wide transformation envelope, with most samples consistent with a type 1 to 2 kerogen. However, in some rare cases, we see type 2 to type 3 kerogen. These results fall within the wide range of bulk kerogen kinetics known in the MacArthur Basin, suggesting that similar systems occur with the north. The net organic richness was calculated for the lawn and river supersequences using well log data. A combination of porosity, resistivity and uranium well logs were used to calculate these ratios in three wells. The results determined that 56.3% of the lawn supersequence has TSC greater than 2 weight percent and 53.4% of the river supersequence has TSC greater than 2 weight percent. This is important as a 2% threshold is used to determine a good petroleum source rock. And these ratios, in combination with organic geochemistry data, demonstrate good shale reservoir characteristics in the region. Now that we have our geochemical and well log data, we can put this into models for the Northern Lawn Hill platform region. Two wells were modelled, focusing again on the lawn and river super sequences. The results show that shales are predominantly mature for gas at these locations, with maturity increasing significantly to the east. These inputs and trends can be used to understand maturity in the Carrara subbasin, where no well penetration currently exists. The new pre-competitive data generated during the EFTF program, in addition to complementary work undertaken by our collaborators, have allowed for a regional shale gas prospectivity analysis. In this study, we've used several geological factors to assess shale gas potential and have compared our results from the South Nicholson region with the Beetaloo subbasin in the north, in addition to well-characterised shale gas systems in North America. Broadly, the geochemistry, shale thickness, mineralogy, pressure and geomechanics are all key factors we've used for this assessment. So let's walk through these components now. A study by Barry Bradshaw et al. characterised the depths, thicknesses and mappable extents of the river and lawn super sequences. Viable gas shale plays are generally encountered at depths of greater than 1,000 metres and contain at least 45 to 100 metres of thick shale. The results here demonstrate that there are extensive, deep and thick shales that are favourable in our shale gas assessment. Geomechanics was assessed using a combination of regional stress variations and the brittleness index calculated from XRD. Stress regimes in the region are poorly defined, but are likely dominated by strike-slip faulting. Stress modelling has demonstrated likely inter- and intra-formational controls over fracture propagation. Shales in the region have variations in brittleness that you can see here on the left-hand figure. The green zone are shales that are brittle, yellow is semi-brittle and red is ductile. Variability occurs for each super sequence, laterally and with depth, but broadly the results are favourable in a shale gas system. Rock properties, including porosity, permeability and fluid saturations, were collated from publicly available well completion reports, and they are also favourable in a shale gas system. These results are comparable to values known in the Beetaloo subbasin. Hydrocarbon shows and indications are direct evidence of a petroleum system. 
a multi-stage plug and perf style fracture treatment was employed in the Eagle Abria 2 well and this resulted in the unassisted recovery of significant volumes of fracture fluids and low surface pressure gas flows. Additionally, potential direct hydrocarbon indicators are identified in the South Nicholson seismic described earlier. In this figure here, we see three stacked seismic anomalies, including flat spots and phase changes occurring in a fault-related anticline. These results suggest gas-filled sands bounded by shales could be present in the Carrara subbasin, increasing the petroleum prospectivity of the region and furthermore, demonstrating both shale gas and conventional gas systems could be present in the region. In summary, newly acquired geochemical data acquired during the EFTF program, including organic geochemistry, mineralogy, log data, combined with petroleum systems models, in addition to shale gas prospectivity analysis with direct hydrocarbon indicators, have demonstrated the presence of organic rich source rocks with gas generative potential in the region. This work significantly increased our understanding of regional petroleum systems and extended the Paleoproterozoic river and lawn supersequences known in the Eagle Abria prospect in far north Queensland to occur deep into the Carrara subbasin in the Northern Territory. For a summary of all our products and data sets, you're encouraged to visit our South Nicholson webpage in addition to the Exploring for the Future data delivery portal. Thanks. Good morning. Today I will be presenting the Exploring for the Future in the Canning Basin, and I'm going to talk about the activities of the Kitson Subbasin Seismic Survey, the Wakali Kali 1 Stratigraphic Well, and the Centralian Superbasin Well Correlation Study. This work is the work of the Onshore Energy Systems team and our collaborators. So far in our presentations, we have been focusing on Northern Australia and on the Northern Territory and Queensland. And now we are going to move to WA, to the large onshore canning basin, which is seen here in the red box. The onshore canning basin covers 530,000 kilometres squared it is an early Ordovician to Cretaceous multi-phase depositional basin. It's subdivided into two tectonostratigraphic subbasins. These are the Fitzroy Trough, Gregory Subbasin Complex in the north, and the Wallara Subbasin, Kidson Subbasin Complex in the south. Despite continuing exploration, the Canning Basin is one of the least explored Paleozoic basins in the world. Potential exists for both unconventional and conventional energy resources that remain largely underexplored and untested. I want to start this talk by talking about land access. Land access is a large part of onshore data collection. During this process, all local stakeholders, including traditional owners, local communities, mine users, road users, just to name a few, are contacted and engaged with. The process is time consuming, but its importance cannot be overstated in producing great science. The Kidson Seismic Survey was acquired along existing roads and tracks between the Kiwakara community in the east and Marble Bar in the west. The Kidson Subbasin Survey was acquired in 2018. It is a part of the EFTF program in partnership and co-funded by the Geological Survey of Western Australia. It was acquired between June and August 2018 and is a whopping 842 kilometres long. And we have it from our team that it is the longest single, uh, longest acquired seismic line in a single go. More information about the survey is available on the webpage. Seismic data acquisition is another important and large aspect of the success of this study. Here you can see some photos and diagrams about how the seismic data is collected. An array is laid out six kilometres either side of the vibrosized trucks with cables and geophones to record the data. The vibrosized truck is, puts an acoustic signal into the earth that is recorded by geophones on the array. The whole array is used and picked up and moved along and covers around 10 to 15 kilometres each day. 
And here's the Vibra size trucks during the data collection, and you can see why this type of data is required. There is sand as far as the eye can see, and no rocks at all. So it's always amazing when we collect our data, and that's what we're going to see on the next slide. The Kids in Subbasin Seismic Survey is a foundational data set that yields insight into the geology and resource poten potential of the Kids in Subbasin. Preliminary interpretation of the seismic data suggests that this part of the Canning Basin is approximately six kilometres deep and 500 kilometres wide. The Kitson Subbasin is a sag type basin with little structuring apart from a few broad folds in the central subbasin. The Unina Subbasin, sorry, the Unina Basin underlies the western part of the Kitson Subbasin and the basement under the majority of the Kitson Subbasin is undefined. From the seismic data, it was clear that additional data for strat such as stratigraphic, stratigraphic drilling was required to understand the seismic data. On this slide, I want to touch on seismic interpretation and the petroleum systems for the kids in subbasin. The Canning Basin fill was deposited during three major periods of subsidence, early Ordovician, late Devonian to early Carboniferous, and mid-Carboniferous to Permian. Numerous organic-rich intervals are present within each of these sedimentary successions. Three out of four of the Larapintine petroleum systems are recognised in the Ordovician to Carboniferous portion of the Canning Basin. However, more work to truth the geology within the Canning subbasin was required, and the drilling of the Wakali Kali 1 subsequently occurred. Now my Colleague Susanna is going to talk more about the petroleum systems in the next talk. The Wakali Kali 1 deep stratigraphic well was drilled in the Wakali embayment in collaboration with the Geological Survey of Western Australia. The well is located 67 kilometres west of Telfer and provides stratigraphic control for the geology imaged on the Kidson seismic. The well was drilled to a total depth of 2,680 metres and penetrated a thin Cenozoic cover which overlay a Permian fluvial clastic succession that includes glacial diamictite, or which overlies an unconformity and a thick Ordovician succession. The well terminated in low-grade metasedimentary rocks of Neoproterozoic age, and the well completion report is due for release later in 2020. Log characterisation, core analysis, geochronology, petrographic and paleontological studies are underway to characterise the lithology, age, depositional environment of these strata. A full suite of inorganic and organic geochemical analysis are being undertaken to determine mineralogy and the quantity, quality and thermal maturity of the organic matter. There was no gas in the mud log, but this is not surprising given that the well was deliberately deliberately situated away from the structural and stratigraphic traps and was fully cored from below 580 metres. Nevertheless, fluid, fluid inclusions in downhole intervals are being examined for the presence of hydrocarbons in this well. Okay. I now want to move on to the third uh, activity within this project and this is the tectonostratigraphic evolution of the Centralian Superbasin. The primary aim of this study was to develop a methodology for visualising the three-dimensional tectonostratigraphic architecture of sedimentary basins using just well data, which can then be used to quickly screen areas warranting more detailed studies of resource potential. The project has developed a workflow which generates three-dimensional well correlation using just well tops. This study uses 13 newly defined supersequences in 134 wells to visualise regional structural and stratigraphic architecture of the Amadeus, Canning, Officer and Georgina basins in the Centralian Superbasin. The Centralian Superbasin is defined in this study as encompassing all western, northern and cent central Australian basins that had interconnected depositional systems driven by the regional subsidence during one or more regional tectonic events between the Neoproterozoic breakup of Rodinia and the middle Carboniferous culmination of the Alice Springs orogeny.
The regional three-dimensional correlations highlight regional structural and stratigraphic architecture of the Centralian Superbasin. This can then be used to visualise the distribution of stratigraphic elements associated with petroleum, mineral and groundwater systems. The report is due for release very shortly. So my concluding remarks today are that the new EFTF Kidson Seismic Survey is a foundational data set for both energy and mineral resources. It is likely that the Kidson Subbasin contains sediments within the Larapintine petroleum systems. The stratigraphic drill hole Wakali Kali 1 will give valuable insights into the links between the Wakali embayment and the Kidson Subbasin. The well will provide valuable stratigraphic control on the geology. And finally, the regional three-dimensional correlation diagrams highlight the structural and stratigraphic architecture of the Centralian Superbasin, which can then be used to visualise the distribution of stratigraphic elements associated, associated with petroleum, mineral and groundwater systems. And for those looking for more information on our uh, studies and our products and reports, they are available on our website. Thank you. This final presentation of our energy program will cover two themes. First, a summary of the regional petroleum systems of the Canning Basin and of Meso and Paleoproterozoic basins of Northern Australia. And second, an overview of the EFTF data discovery portal. By now, you'll be quite familiar with this map of the EFTF project area. The focus regions for the energy program were selected based on an extensive review of the data availability and prospectivity of onshore sedimentary basins published in the onshore basins inventory. A part of this project was identifying basins with good hydrocarbon prospectivity but poor data availability. On this basis, the Phanerozoic Canning Basin and the Meso and Paleoproterozoic Birindudu, MacArthur and South Nicholson Basins and Mount Isa Province were selected as our focus areas for further study of petroleum systems. The overall aim for this component of the energy program was to improve our understanding of regional hydrocarbon potential. The first step was to assimilate and QC all available or legacy data to identify existing data gaps and to plan additional data acquisition. This was followed up with a new data collection and analysis program. All data sets were interpreted, made publicly available and also fed into model generation. The aim was to produce publicly available and consistent models addressing a number of scientific questions that would form a baseline for other organisations and industry to build on. These models aim to be used as predictive tools in frontier areas that have a greater paucity of available data. A full petroleum systems analysis of these huge areas would take significant resources and data acquisition. The EFTF program, therefore, focused on characterising the source rock formations. In other words, the goal was to understand and parameterise the rocks that generated hydrocarbons, as shown in the schematic here. The aim of this was twofold. Firstly, from a conventional aspect, it creates an understanding of the type and amount of hydrocarbon fluids that may have been generated. And secondly, the source rock is also the reservoir in unconventional resource plays, so understanding the former provides invaluable information on the latter. In the areas of interest, as already highlighted in the previous talks, data acquisition targeted known data gaps with the aim of complementing and building on pre-existing data. In the Canning Basin study, data acquisition targeted the Frontier Kidson Subbasin, and in the Proterozoic Northern Australian Basins, data acquisition was focused away from the Beetaloo Subbasin and Lawn Hill Platform, which are both regions of current exploration interest and activity. Data analysis included total organic carbon and rock eval to understand the organic richness, thermal maturity and hydrocarbon generative potential of the source rocks. Fluid to source rock correlation is a key component of petroleum systems analysis and this was achieved by analysing gas and fluid inclusions, biomarkers and carbon-13 isotopes. Finally, phase carriage and kinetic models have facilitated our understanding of how specific organic matter in the source rock intervals responds to thermal maturation, giving us an idea of the depths and temperatures of hydrocarbon that hydrocarbon is generated and expelled. The Canning Basin has yielded minor gas and oil in both conventional and unconventional reservoirs. However, parts of the basin remain highly underexplored. Our knowledge of the potentially highly prospective Larapintine Petroleum Supersystem is limited by the scarcity of samples. 
This map shows the location of samples collected from petroleum wells and mineral drill holes under the EFTF program. As previously mentioned, the aim was to gather new data in the frontier parts of the basin away from the known accumulations in the north, although these better known regions do provide key insight into petroleum systems elsewhere in the basin. Samples were analysed for a suite of geological geochemical parameters as discussed on the previous slide. As already discussed, parts of the Canning Basin remain highly underexplored, despite numerous publications indicating both conventional and unconventional hydrocarbon potential. There is a particular lack of natural gas samples, so Geoscience Australia analysed gases trapped in fluid inclusions from 121 rock samples collected from 70 exploration wells that had elevated mud gas readings. The results, summarised in the figures here and referenced in the hyperlinks below, have enabled gas-to-gas -gas correlations and an improved understanding of source-to-trap migration and preservation history. Meso and Paleoproterozoic basins are traditionally bypassed and considered unprospective for hydrocarbons due to their age, as risk to trap integrity and hydrocarbon preservation is high. However, the number of oil and gas shows throughout these ancient northern Australian basins tells a different story. The Greater MacArthur Basin in the Northern Territory and the Mount Isa province, including the Lawn Hill Platform in far northwest Queensland, have the potential to host conventional and unconventional oil and gas accumulations. Both regions have had moderate historical exploration history that has gained momentum over the past five years and generated significant global interest. As already presented by Amber Jarrett, a compilation of legacy data focusing on source rock characterization was carried out to produce a baseline understanding of regional source rocks and to identify data gaps. This was followed with an extensive sample collection and geochemical analysis program targeting the data poor regions. Here we show TOC and Rock Eval results split across the South Nicholson and Isa Super Basin on the left and the Greater MacArthur Basin to the right. Results from this program vastly improve data coverage throughout the region and demonstrate that there are a number of potential source rock intervals with fair to excellent source rock richness, which warrant further investigation and should not be overlooked as exploration targets. This new data has also enabled us to redefine the petroleum system extents across the region as shown in the maps here. By combining the legacy and newly acquired geochemical data with seismic and well data, we have redefined the potential extent of the two main petroleum supersystems across Meso and Paleoproterozoic Northern Australian basins. On the left is the Paleoproterozoic MacArthur supersystem, and on the right, the Mesoproterozoic Urupungan supersystem, including the prospective Valkyrie and Kyla formations and their correlative, correlative equivalents. The supersystem extent is colour-coded based on the level of uncertainty in the interpretation defined by the available data used. This demonstrates that organic-rich shaley source rock units of the MacArthur and Urupungum petroleum supersystems can be mapped from the Birundudu in the west, eastwards through the MacArthur Basin, and to the South Nicholson Basin and Isa Super Basin, which is potentially a very large exploration fairway. I'll now move on to the second part of this presentation, which presents the EFTF Data Discovery Portal. Petroleum geochemical data sets and information are essential to government for evidence-based decision-making on natural resources and to the petroleum industry for de-risking exploration. Geoscience Australia's newly built Data Discovery Portal displays online and up-to-date information on many geoscientific themes, and one of these is organic geochemistry, thus providing data on source rocks, fluids and petroleum systems for the whole of the Australian continent. These data have been collected over several decades from open file sources. By bringing together all petroleum data into a single platform, the portal aspires to build a national-scale understanding of Australia's oil and gas resources. The online data delivery system uses a standard web browser that anyone can access from anywhere without the need for a special login or software. Functionalities include searching, filtering and downloading data, as well as visualising data via interactive maps, graphs and statistics. Custom-designed analytical tools enable interrogation of source rock and petroleum fluids data within boreholes and field sites, which facilitates correlation of these elements of the petroleum system within and between basins. The data can be graphically displayed, analysed statistically and downloaded in a variety of formats. This snapshot here is just one example of the predefined plots available to visualise data within the portal. 
Another tool developed under the Energy Programme is the Petroleum Systems Summary Assessment Tool, which provides a summary of the current understanding of key petroleum systems for the EFTF Programme's areas of focus. The aim of the tool is to provide the user with the high-level information required when looking into a basin for the first time. This includes a high-level summary of the petroleum systems within a basin and interpreting key data sets related to conventional and unconventional hydrocarbon exploration. This is to enable quick analysis of a basin's prospectivity and petroleum systems. As shown here, the petroleum systems of each basin are summarized for the key elements of source, reservoir and seal. Key parameters for each element are captured in summary tables with references back to the source of the data. Tabulation of key parameters enables rapid assessment of a basin's prospectivity in relation to both unconventional and conventional resources. Data gaps are identified, which may assist in developing future work programs. The information figures and tables in each summary can be downloaded as a PDF report. So that wraps up the energy component of the EFTF program. Please browse our website for more detailed information and links to the many products and publications highlighted during these presentations. We would like to take the opportunity again to thank our many collaborators throughout this program. And we will now open the forum up for questions and discussions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Serkham, and I'm the program coordinator for the Exploring for the Future program, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to the Q&A session of today's roadshow. I hope you have found the uh, presentation very informative. I have some of our experts online to answer some of your questions. Um, I have uh, Ladina Carr, who's the acting director for the onshore energy section. Chris Carson, who's a geoscientist, as you, as you heard in the talk, was uh, heavily involved in the Self Nicholson project. And Amber Jarrett, um, our petroleum geochemist. Uh, you will see a Q&A box at the bottom of the, of the screen. So can you, if you want to send us a question, can you please open that and uh, send that, um, type in your questions and send it through. Uh, that would be, that would be great. Um, and uh, we'll aim to get through as many of the questions as possible in the next 15 minutes or so. But uh, any questions that we don't get to, we'll uh, follow up. In um, directly in person. Um, one of the, we've had a few questions already around uh, when the presentations that um, you've just seen will be made available, and uh, we will aim to do that, uh, have those up uh, and available through our um, publication system um, very shortly as well. Um, also, the the content that you've just seen will also be um, on demand uh, as well, so you'll be able to log back in and have a look at any time. So, to our first question. Um, which I, I will pass to, to Amber, is around the, uh, the petroleum system analysis um, that was shown um, and how that fits in with some of the, the main extensional events, um, particularly uh, in the Lawn Hill area where um, other evidence shows that the maximum extensional strain occurred at about um, 1,640 million years ago. So, um, that, you know, the timing and the geochronology works out, but I guess the, the question is around how does this link uh, to the petroleum system development in that. So, over to you, Amber. Thank you, Keith. Um, so, this is quite a complex um, question and I'm, I'm really glad it's been asked. So our petroleum systems modeler is Tahani Palu and she's currently writing up a record about the burial and thermal history modeling that's gone into our petroleum systems model. So just the um, best way to answer that is by giving you a bit of a rundown of our petroleum systems workflow. So what we need to do first I guess is to uh, construct the burial history model and to do that we use um, age, thickness, lithology of the sedimentary units, use our understanding of the basins, including any um, extension and contraction events, um, input information about uh, paleo water depths, then we put in our different heat, thermal and time um, information and uh, to calibrate our model. So yes, we are using the extensional events um, that have been raised here. Uh, and this model, uh, some of it's been released in an API extended abstract, and then the larger model will be released in the future. So for that, I think stay tuned to our um, EFTF South Nicholson website, and you'll be able to see when that becomes available. Over to you, Keith. 
Thank you, Amber. Okay, uh, the next question I have, I'll pass to Ludina. Uh, are there, I'm sorry, is there any interpretations published for the kids in Seismic and uh, when, where and when will these be available? Over to you, Ladina. Thanks, Keith. It's a great question. It's an area generating quite a lot of interest. Um, so there is a, a preliminary or a, um, a first interpretation that was published uh, last time that AESC rolled around, and this is available through a link on our uh, Kitson Seismic or our Kitson um, Basin uh, webpage, and uh, you should be able to see a link on the side of the resource list for this presentation, and it will take you to the Kitson Subbasin, and then a link of um, a link to that product, and also to the data products are available from that uh, webpage. And any future publications for the Kitson will also be linked there, so it's a really great place to uh, check in with every so often. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Ladina. Uh, the next question I'll pass to um, to Chris is around the uh, Carrara Subbasin. Um, so, the full question is: Is the Carrara Subbasin gravity low entirely accounted for by the interpreted thickness of the Self-Nicholson group, given Isa Superbasin fill is generally quite dense? Have magnetic features on this line? Um, sorry, read that again. Have magnetic features on this line also been accounted for? Uh, over to you, Chris. Uh, thanks, Keith, and thanks, Mark, for your uh, question. Uh, in answer to your question, we haven't done any detailed specific potential field modelling across the Carrara Subbasin. All the interpretations that we've uh, presented, both published and in the, our presentations today, have been um, uh, have been based on the seismic character of those super basins uh, elsewhere. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot more work that can be done across the Carrara Subbasin, but as yet, um, uh, we haven't done that level of um, potential field modelling to fully answer your question. Um, hopefully that will answer, um, provide some information for you. Um, back to you, Keith. Thank you, Chris. Yes, there's still a few things that need to be done yet. There's uh, always more room for discovery. Uh, so the next question, I'll go back to Amber um, with this one. So uh, the question is, uh, just wondering if there is a calculated heat flow value for the uh, two kilometre stratigraphic hole. Uh, over to you, Amber. Thanks, Keith. So in the Wakali Kali one, uh, there were two formation temperatures um, taken at 1600 metres, and that was 60 degrees, and at around uh, 2600 metres, and that was 97 degrees. So while these uh, temperatures were taken, um, the drillers provided to us circulation time, but they didn't provide the time since circulation. And so according to uh, one of our um, petroleum systems modelers here, um, because of this, we could not calculate the, the Horner correction um, of the bottom hole temperature. So all this is currently being written um, up into a GA record, and um, I would just say to stay tuned for that. Back to you, Keith. Thank you, Amber. Okay, um, so yep, we've got questions coming in. So the next one I will um, pass to uh, Ladina, so I guess this is um, related to um, basically probably a similar question about where data is available. So the question is, uh, is all the data related to the energy products collected by GA now available? Over to you, Ladina. Thanks, uh, Keith. Yeah, it's a similar question, but um, I guess uh, I can make it clear with this one that um, of each of the seismic surveys uh, collected as part of this program, they are now processed and available for download through the um, web page. Um, so all the big data sets are available. The uh, well that was drilled in the Wakali uh, embayment is um, also available. The basic well completion report has been released and it's available on WAPMS, so our colleagues in um, WA's website. and. There will be a follow-up report with the interpretive products coming for that one. Uh, each of the major uh, um, acquisitions will have a report um, 
that will be put up on our web, website and right now you should um, be able to see on the South Nicholson one, the South Nicholson Seismic Interpretation Record is available for download. Uh, there's going to be a Canning one in the future and uh, we anticipate that will be um, one for the Barclay Seismic as well. Uh, there's also a range there of, of the other um, products that, you know, build on, on these basic data sets and, and combine and integrate with other products. So there's a big range of things there and hopefully something for everyone. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Ladina. Okay, uh, I have another question here for, for Chris. Um, can you tell us more about the, uh, the Barclay Seismic? Because I guess that was their most recent acquisition. So um, we're, where are the results from that sitting at? Over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Yeah, um, the Barclay Seismic was completed late last year. We've only just um, finished uh, processing the data. The data is now available on our EFTF uh, website for download, so you can go to that site and download it and um, do and do whatever you'd like to do to it. Uh, our interpretation of that data is uh, still to be released, and we're currently writing that up as we speak. Um, but um, that's that's where uh, that's where the Barclay Seismic um, Survey information is at the moment. So I urge you to go to our EFTF webpage and uh, download the data. Uh, thanks, Keith. Back back to you. Excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Okay. Uh, next question I have, I will uh, pass to uh, Amber. So. Yeah, uh, the question is, is helium one of the minerals of interest of, in the petroleum natural gas exploration studies? And are you or others using helium sniffing tools, um, such as portable spectrometers, to search for helium? Um, over to you, Amber. Thanks, Keith. Uh, helium is definitely something that we are interested in at Geoscience Australia. It's listed as a critical commodity, and we all know that um, that we need to do more exploration in that way. So uh, Dr Chris Borum is our geochemist who specialises in helium gas. He's released a paper in APR, which you can again go to our South Nicholson uh, website and find the link to that. So what we do at Geoscience Australia is look at the composition of natural gases, looking at uh, the percentage of helium and therefore which basins may or may not be prospective for helium. And we've also started looking at uh, gases in fluid inclusions as another way to characterise uh, um, per percentage of helium. Back to you, Keith. Uh, thank you, Amber. Um, so one more question here. Actually, I'll probably pass this back to you, Amber. Um, uh, the question is, the, uh, the data discovery portal um, extended abstract lists additional layers such as bulk isotopes that are not yet accessible on the portal. Uh, when will all the data be live on the portal? Um, back to you, Amber. Yeah, thanks, Keith. So our data delivery portal has, I guess, over 200 new data sets and reports available. It is a very big process in getting our layers, which are um, in a range of different um, formats, including Excel sheets and Oracle databases. We need to get that data into a system on the portal that's going to be user-friendly and stable. So Dr. Diane Edwards has been running that program. She's been doing an amazing job QCing all that data uh, one layer at a time, working with our developers and getting it onto the portal. So at the moment, if you go onto our EFTF portal into the energy persona, you can see all the data that's specific for energy exploration, and that includes uh, the basin boundaries, seismic, uh, geochronology, and our organic geochemistry. At the moment, there are pyrolysis layers um, and total organic carbon and rocky valve layers, and that's just the start. So yes, we will be um, providing additional layers, including the bulk isotopes mentioned, uh, carbon-specific um, isotopes of N-alkanes, which we can be uh, using for oil source rock correlations and biomarkers. Uh, it's my understanding that some of these are in the production phase, so they're not quite live on our website. We're just testing them in the back, but we are committed to making sure that all those layers 
in the extended abstract are out and available for the public uh, shortly. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Amber. Uh, one more question for, uh, I'll pass this to um, to Chris about the Carrara Basin, I guess. So just for, I guess, a bit more further commentary on about the, the mapping of the, of the Carrara Basin and determining its um, density and thickness and things like that. Um, uh, we've been reminded about the, some of the passive seismic work that was done in that area. Do you want to comment further on that, Chris? Over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Keith. Yeah, I personally haven't done any work with the passive seismic data that's been collected across the uh, South Nicholson region. It's another very valuable data set that uh, all of us um, uh, can make use of. Um, but I personally haven't done any work specifically with that. Um, I guess all as I want to say is that is available and available for us to aid our interpretation across the uh, the Carrara Subbasin. I would also like to point out too the airborne AEM that was run across a vast area of the um, study area too. Um, that's, uh, I haven't looked at that data in detail, but that certainly uh, shows up uh, faults and conductive, pos and conductive uh, units that may represent present some of the uh, mineral occurrences that we identified on the ground. So there's lots, to, there's lots of data sets out there that were collected in the area as part of the AFTF program and uh, there's a lot of work to be done in interpreting um, those data sets in detail. Uh, back to you Keith. Thank you, Chris, um, and thank you, everyone. I'd make that um, time to, to wrap things up. So uh, thank you, everyone, who's uh, uh, stayed on to ask all of those wonderful questions. Uh, there's a, um, a few more that we haven't quite got time to get to right now, but we will certainly follow up in person um, with to answer those. So um, yeah, thank you for um, taking part in today, and um, hopefully it's been a very interesting insight into the energy potential of Northern Australia, as we've discovered it through the course of the Exploring for the Future program. And I hope you've all taken away some key information that will help your work. Uh, if you haven't already, I'll give a bit of a plug for the um, tomorrow's roadshow, which will be about uh, groundwater research in northern Australia. Very exciting stuff because nothing, nothing, as you know, in Australia happens without a close eye on water. Um, and uh, that's on Thursday. And then, of course, we've got our um, discussion panel on Friday, which we're very much looking forward to hearing from stakeholders about uh, their views on the achievements of the program and what the next steps are going to be. Um, so you, you should see a registration link in the, the window as well. So thank you again for joining us and from all of us here at Geoscience Australia, have a good afternoon. Goodbye.